Can you believe it? Season 4, episode 58. We here, right? We in here. Man, went by fast. Anyway, today, in this episode of Where My Killer Tape At, I'm going to talk about your man, Liam Neeson's. You taking that taking too far, right? Um, you know, you got to talk about blackface shenanigans. We're also going to talk about why we should abolish, abolish ICE and free 21 Savage. Remember that video about that little girl with the back in the olden times? We're going to talk about that. Um, shout out to the homie of Disa Banjoko because we're going to talk about tagging and teaching the youth. And of course, we'll bring back the health segment and how to approach women. Yo, check it out, party people. Where my killer tape at? Yeah. A one, two. A one, two. A one, two. A one, two. I like to introduce myself. I like to introduce myself. For episode 58 of Where My Killer Tape At, I'm sipping on raspberry milk stout. It's actually a stout with raspberries added, just like it says, right? Check this out. It has roasted coffee notes combined with raspberry and chocolate malt for the creamy decadence. And you know what? It's a lot, but it's actually pretty good. It reminds me of a sour, but kind of like a stout. So for those of you that can't do stouts, this might be up your alley. Then this is done by Left Hand Brewing Company out of Logmont, Colorado. Shout out to the Barrel House for this introduction. Peace. <laughs> First up, um, Free 21 Savage. And I'm going to say this real quick. Like, um, you know, he he was born in, in the UK and he moved to Atlanta when he was a young boy. You know what I mean? So why are we out here talking about he's not really from the ATL? To me, wherever, wherever you spend your formative years, like, you know, like parts of middle school and high school, like he did. Some say, you know, he was there since elementary school, since third grade. Um, then to me, that's where you're from. Uh, plus, I'm the type of person that I try not to negate nobody's experiences unless they're not true. And I'm not, you know, he's seen some of his homies get murdered in the game. Um, so I'm not going to try to front and act like I know his life or try to deny his experience. But we're behind you, 21 Savage. We love you. You out here educating young people. And I think we should commend somebody who, you know, went, went through some stuff and then realized that he can use his platform to educate and help other people, and particularly in his community. So you get love from me on that. Um, I don't know the particulars of this organiz you know, of this investigation, but what I do know is that I don't trust the police. I don't believe the police. They always lying, uh, particularly those that work for the federal government. Now let's talk about ICE and why we should abolish ICE, right? ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and they are actually a, a wing of the the Homeland, you know, the Department of Homeland Security, um, and their job is to investigate, you know, you know, uh, issues of immigration. And also potential um, foreign nationals who are here to do terrorism, right? Which, which you know, a lot of times we see the Department of Homeland Security call, label people terrorists who are not terrorists. And we've seen since Department of Labor, Department of Homeland Security was created um, in 2002, we've seen um, them, you know, them alongside other agencies such as the FBI, who's always been instigators of bullshit, right? Um, call out people who are actually innocent. And, and locked them up under the idea that they were terrorists, right? Without any proof whatsoever. So when they ran up on, on the homie, I knew something was fishy. So I think that we need to discuss that. But um, I just want to talk more about ICE and what they do. Again, they were, they were, you know, the Department of Homeland Security was created under the Homeland Security Act in 2002 because of what happened on 9-11 um, under the Bush administration. Um, they was on some bullshit ever since. And I know there used to be different parts because I know the, the, the investigative, the detention and the port deportation resources of what was once Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS, is what became um, ICE, what we call ICE. So um, 
they have plenty of jurisdiction, even though a lot of it is illegal and we know it's unconstitutional, to literally lock people up uh, without probable cause in most cases and without evidence in all cases uh, indefinitely. So when that happens, they don't have access to a lawyer. Um, you know, they just, you know, all that stuff about habeas corpus that you see in the, the Constitution. Habeas corpus means produce the body, meaning um, if I get arrested, you know, um, whoever arrests me, they have to actually show the charges, give me a chance to get legal counsel, and also uh, get a chance to post bail. Um, so I know what's going on. Um, and they literally take away that rid of habeas corpus. So um, they've been doing that for, for, you know, going on almost 20 years, right? 16 years now, right? So, and, and you know, 21 Savage is their latest victim. And, you know, I, let's take this opportunity to learn what's going on. I think it was dope because I had some young people come up and ask me, what, what is ICE, right? Because usually when we talk about ICE, we only talk about um, immigrants, right? So a lot of us um, who are not part of the immigrant community or descendants of immigrants, because not everybody was an immigrant in this, in this United States, just to let y'all know, I don't believe in that shit, but um, um, we, they don't know what's going on. So this is an opportunity to do that and why we should abolish ICE. So hashtag abolish ICE, you see how they get down. And I hope this is helpful for you. Free 21 Savage, word. Unless you've been hiding under a rock, you heard about your man Liam Neesoms, right? Shout out to Key and Peel for that one. Liam Neesoms, I know I spelled it wrong in the title. That was a whole point to that. Um, if you ain't up on Key and Peel, you won't know what I'm talking about. You should check that out, though. Anyway, um, Liam Neeson, the uh, actor who's played, you know, Qui-Gon Jinn in Star Wars, which I liked him in that. He played Ra's al Ghul in Batman, um, you know, with Christian Bale, which I actually liked him in. And he is probably well best known for his role as the protagonist in the Taken series. They actually have three movies. And I remember after he did Taken 1, he said, Oh, I'm not going to do no more of these movies or these action movies. And if you notice, in the last 10 years, he's been doing those same kind of movies where he has a particular skill set. Um, Y'all know me. Um, I stopped being a fan of the Impossible White Man series. Uh, shout out to Rodimus Prime, uh, the Black Guy Who Tis podcast for that, that term. I'm using that term from him. Where a white dude could just do every fucking thing. He can ride a motorcycle. Um, he can shoot guns in the water. You know, he's a great scuba diver. He could disarm nuclear bombs. He could fly a helicopter. He could do all that. You know what I mean? He could he could do equations, all that. You know what I mean? So I'm not a big fan of those movies because they get they just get bored and tiring, right? Um, anyway, this he he did a uh, uh, interview with the Independent where he admits to um, you know what happened was he learned that a friend of his was raped. And um, he went out in the street looking for the next black guy to say something to him so he can pretty much beat him to death. Um, I know I'm paraphrasing, but I do recommend reading the article. There's two articles, actually. There's one that has the actual interview and then the second one where they kind of like analyze what he said and then actually bring in a doctor who talks about it. And, and this, you, you guys got to read it. it it's, it's just you really have to read it because I'm seeing a lot of celebrities, particularly black celebrities, defend him. And I'm like, y'all didn't read the article. Right. OK, so here it is. And I'm paraphrasing in the article because he's, he's doing a movie. He's promoting a movie called Cold Pursuit, which is pretty much taken. But this time is his son. Right. And um, he's kind of like promoting that. So um, they talked. They, they asked him about, you know, why he does so many revenge movies and stuff like that. But anyway, in the course of that discussion, he says that a friend of his was raped and he was upset. Right. He was like he was really upset and he, he wanted to get revenge. But but you got to you got to read the article because in the article. He asked the victim, who was it? And she says, I don't know, right? Then he says, was he colored? That's, you know, that, you know it's kind of like, you know, I could see if she said he was black, but he's like, was he colored? So she says, yes. So he says for about a week, he goes out in the street with a, um, I forgot the term he used, but it just means a, a, a big stick. Um, because, you know, in the UK, you can't, it's, it's illegal to, to purchase guns. So that's why you hear a lot of stabbings over there. Anyway, neither here nor there. So he, he walks around waiting for a black person to say something to him so he could pretty much beat him down with the stick. Anyway, um, you know, as he discusses this, 
he does say, I apologize for having thoughts of revenge. Right? That's, I want to be clear about that because he never says, I apologize for having those racist thoughts. He says, I apologize for, um, you know, having, you know, having thoughts of revenge. And I think that's real crucial because, you know, he, you know, okay, I can take that revenge thing, right? But to, for him to say, I was, you know, looking for someone black to beat up and he didn't apologize for that says a lot, right? And then the second article, which I posted, right? You know, I'm posting the show notes. They have actually a doctor who says, a lot of white people have those kind of thoughts. Whoa. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, um, you know, it's funny. Be, and I'm not blaming the the, 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 the expert on saying that uh, because the person that interviewed the, the, that expert could have said, you know, you know, um, why you think that is, you know, and but they don't really get into it, right? But we know, we know, you know, black people know, black and brown people know that a lot of white people have these ideas of beating up black and brown people. They do. They actually do. And we see it manifest all the time on video, right? That we put on the internet. So, um, and, and I think Black Celebrities is saying, I'm glad he admitted it. But what? We, but the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Again, he did not apologize for what he said. He just apologized for the revenge thoughts or what he thought and what he actually did. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's one thing to have the thought, but to actually go out there and do something and try to do something and wait around, that's deep. And we got to remember that we see a lot of people in authority, particularly law enforcement, who have these same ideas and they put them into action, right? George Zimmerman is a good example of that, right? He, though he's not law, law enforcement, he has this idea of being the vigilante that catches those black, those dirty black and brown people who are up to no good. And, that, and that's a discussion that we need to have. That's what we really, really need to discuss. Like, why is that? Of course, you know, white supremacy, right? You know, um, and this idea that crime is brought in by these hordes of black and brown people. That's where that comes down, down to, right? But we're not having that discussion. And I think that's a discussion that um, Liam Neeson needs to really have with himself and his community. So there you have it. Fuck Liam Neeson. Down white supremacy. And that's how we're going to do. And yo, Liam Neeson, you tripping. You let them taking movies go to your head, son. You really, really did. Blackface shenanigans. Damn, bro. I told you. I, what I tell y'all last episode, right? In episode 57, I told y'all the saga's not over. So y'all know about your boy Ralph, Ralph Northam, um, the gov current governor of Virginia, who just keeps slipping, right? Anyway, they wanted to get the, uh, the uh, vice governor to take his place, but then there's allegations of sexual harassment for him. We'll warn that on another episode. Anywho's, so they're thinking about looking at Attorney General Mark Herring of Virginia, right, to kind of like step in his place. But guess what? Mark Herring talked about he did the same thing when he was in college. Ah, right? And then we just had Gucci uh, did a whole set of just blackface. Just, just they, I think they had like a, a, a bomber coat that had like the Zambo, Sambo faces on there. You know what I mean? They had the women coming up with the knit um, um, blackface mask. Like, yo, like, like yo, they wildin'. They wildin', right? And then Cory Booker, who's considering winning for the president of the United States on the Democratic ticket, talked about how a lot of his white friends, and you know, he's almost 50, how a lot of his white friends ain't know what the big deal about blackface is. Yo, cats is wildin' out here. Again, I'm going to say it again. Every October 1st, we talk about, you know what I'm saying, how blackface is not a good idea, and some idiots at some fraternity in some upscale college do it, anyway and then they get called out on it right so like it, i could see if if this is something you a lot of white people didn't know about you know pre-social media right because people weren't getting caught up like that you know they were but not as often as they are now right so like you would think that i'm gonna say i'm gonna give them 10 years ago it's something they wouldn't know about right but now it's like if you don't know i, I don't know man i just, I just I just don't know. I just don't know how you know about the, the ice bucket challenge, but you don't know about how blackface is not good. And and every it seems like every October on CNN, there's this discussion on whether blackface is good or not. And they and even Fox News has it. And it's kind of like, how you not know? Don't get me wrong. When it comes to race relationships, most Americans don't know what the fuck they're talking about anyway, right? But still, come on, man. Like, 
ain't no damn excuse. Like, come on, man. Like, at this day and age, like right now, no. If you got a Facebook account, no. I can see if you don't have a Facebook account, I'll let you slide on that. But if you watch the news cycle every year in October, that's what they talk about. Come on, man. What y'all going to do about that, man? Talk to your peoples, man. Cory Booker, talk to your men's. <laughs> There's a YouTube video in circulation that I want to address. I'm not going to mention the, the young the young girl's name. Um, I think she got enough likes, and, and I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, and, and actually, like, what I'm seeing a lot of people do is, like, berate her for that. And, um, and, and there's a difference between berating and educating them, right? That's the difference, right? Like, oh, you're stupid. You know what you're talking about. Let me just say this. She's Dominican. I'm, my folks from Dominican Republic. And at age 13, and I'm assuming she's probably 14 or 15, at age 13, I was kicking the same shit because that's what I was taught, right? Um, there's a lot of anti-blackness in the Dominican community. There's a lot of anti-blackness in the Latino community. Really, in, in almost all communities, there's a lot of anti-blackness. So it's, I'm not going over uncharted territory here. But I know when I was 13, I felt the same way. And it wasn't until I went to school in Harlem and it was, it was the brothers there. I went to an all-boys school. It was the brothers there that schooled me, um, you know, um, on what happened during, you know, the transatlantic slave trade and how Africans were brought to, you know, Latin America, Central America, you know what I'm saying, throughout the world. So, like, that makes perfect sense. Um, we also know that, because um, uh, there's people like, like, I'm going to give you an example, like Sammy Sosa he used to play ball. Remember that guy? Um, and, you know, he he's Afro-Latino, he, but he would claim Indian. He would, you know, meaning meaning Native and American, First Nation peoples. He would claim that all the time. Like a lot of people in my family, they do the same thing. They claim, oh, I'm dark-skinned because I'm Indian. There's no African in me. And we know that not to be true. Uh, we know, if you read Christopher Columbus's diaries, which you can actually download online for free, he explains how he committed genocide against the Tainos. Um, those, are the, those are the First Nation peoples that inhabited the Caribbean island of, the, you know, of what they call now called Hispaniola now. Um, but it used to be called Aiti and Kaunabo, um, back before, you know, pre-Columbian times. Um, so that, that, that right there, he, he describes how he, he first, how he, a lot of them died because of the diseases that the Europeans bought. And a lot of them, then he later killed the rest of them. Um, and he describes it very vividly in his, in his diaries. There's a small tribe that survived. Um, in Puerto Rico, um, in one particular village, and which later became a town. But pretty much through those islands, he wiped them out. Um, and those that didn't die, they fled uh, to Central America. So, uh, you know, a lot of people would claim that. But anyway, um, I only, you know, the, the ironic part about that young lady is that, again, I was the same way at that age. So I really, you know what I'm saying? Like somebody had to school me. So again, there's a difference between educating and berating. If someone had berated me, I probably wouldn't have been open to the information, right? So that's what we got to start doing. And, and let me just say this. She's not the only one that feels that way. I want you to take note because last time I checked, when I first saw the video, she had 30,000 likes. I mean, she had 30,000 views, right? And she had like 2,500 2, likes. So like that was the time that I saw it. I see, it's been circulating a lot on my timeline on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook, so I wouldn't know. But I'm assuming it's probably double that on Facebook. So I'm sure there's a lot of people that saw it more people that liked it. Um, so that really, like, you're always going to have people that are going to say way out crazy stuff. That's one thing that I want to point out. Um, but I always look at the followers and what they got to say. So there's a lot of people that feel that way and they circulate that video because they kind of agree with her. And that's where it gets dangerous, right? <laughs> this is a real quick geek moment. Um, I just picked up Saladin Ahmed's uh, Miles Morales, um, which is amazing. I know I'm late. I'm always behind on my comic books. But let me just say this. Saladin Ahmed, um, he actually wrote a dope book. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I did a review on it a couple years back. And then when he did Black Bolt, I was kind of geek. Again, I've recommended Black Bolt before by Saladin Ahmed. I'm not a big and human fan, but I do like Black Bolt. Um, and I think I used that series. Um, it ended. 
But I use no, no, it's still going on. My bad, my bad. It's still going on. I use that series, the first six issues, first seven issues, to talk about the prison industrial complex. And Saladin Ahmed actually has some write-ups in there about the prison industrial complex. And I taught that in my seventh grade class when we talked about em empathy. This is when I taught middle school. And um, so I highly recommend that. And he just writes really well. But what I like about this Miles Morales run is that he really makes a lot of cultural references. So I highly recommend that. So if you're not reading Saladin Ahmed, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, that brother is dope. So pick that up. Um, he also writes another one for Image that I cannot remember. But I get, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review that in a future episode. Um, so definitely like check that brother out. Word. I, I want to talk about tagging. When I mean tagging, I don't mean like hashtags, bro. <laughs> I don't mean like hitting somebody up. On, on, on the gram with the at symbol. I mean like old school tagging, like doing tags on the wall. Shout out to Adisa Banjoko about this. And this is, I, I hope this doesn't turn into a series, but, um, and that's Adisa Banjoko of the Bishop Chronicles, which you should be listening to. Anyway, um, he talked about how he still tags. And yes, I still tag at 45. I always tell my students, don't let, don't, don't, don't leave me alone with a Sharpie. Um, and, and as a parent, like I had a question myself because like, you know, when you a parent, you don't want your kids to, to be out there breaking laws. But the thing is, I kind of feel like it's hypocritical of any parent to really try to talk their child into doing some things that they, you know what I'm saying? Like that they did as when they were kids. Because the worst thing you could do as a parent is um, act like he was never a kid. You know what I'm saying? That being said, I'm not saying that if you, if you was a, if you was in, if you're in jail for life for murder, you should have tried to talk your kid out of not killing somebody, out of killing somebody. You know what I'm saying? You should talk him out of that. You know what I mean? But I'm talking about stuff like tagging. You know what I'm saying? Like things of that nature. And let me just say this. Tagging comes from graffiti or what we call writing. And it's part of hip hop culture. It's a five element of hip hop culture. So for me, tagging has always been a thing of, of self-expression, of putting my name out there, right? Putting our names out there in a society that cons consistently tries to marginalize and erase our existence which is a form of violence, right? Um, so like, I remember when my, my middle son, who's an artist, I remember when he was a baby, when he was like two or three, he used to ride on all, all the walls all over the place. And I would never, I would never berate him and I would never correct him, quote unquote correct him, and I would never try to change that behavior. I felt like he was expressing himself. So I never really wigged out on that. So, um, and, and so did his mom didn't do the same thing either. And he's an artist now because we allow him to do that. As an educator, this, my students that like to doodle, I let them doodle on, 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 you know, on their work as long as it doesn't cover the answers. Because I know for them, it keeps them still and it helps them think. So, like, that's why I don't have an issue with kids tagging as long as it's not like they're drawing penises or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? But, like, and they're not, like, saying, like, you know, fuck this person or whatever. But they just putting their name up there. And I have given some students their own tag names so they can remain, remain anonymous like any writer would, right? So I think it's a good form of self-expression, so I don't really knock it. You can say what you want about it. Uh, and I'm not saying that people should be going into your private property and doing that. I'm not condoning that at all. Um, but I do feel like you should allow young people to really express themselves. Uh, maybe create what's called the permission wall in your classroom or in your house. Or, or a public space where young people could do those kind of things because I think tagging is important. And also, um, one thing I learned like with my with my middle son as he was going through art school, like I was able to teach him things about lettering that he was going to learn later on in school. And um, that's something that I learned on the street. And to me, that demonstrates how we value our own shit. We value the things that we create. So for me, showing people how to tag and discussing tagging and everything is a way for me to express value on the things that I create and the things that I do. So I just wanted to talk about that real quick. Thanks, um, Brother Disa. Love you. This is a man's world. But it would be nothing. Nothing. This is a man's world. Part three. Part three. Part Sublime McCarthy, heavy on the disc. You blink my ice ring, dumb you bring. Yeah, that's small thing. Part three, QBC, Sublime McCarthy. 
right for this segment of how to approach women for episode 58 uh comes from a, a listener who's been listening for a while uh they shot me a dm and they had a question just real quick um they wanted me to keep it anonymous and i did reply to them and ask for some clarification their question was that they wanted to approach someone at work um and and the, the two questions that i have for them was number one uh, is that person in the same department as you are and how frequently do you see them and that also includes you know do you actually work with them um so and the reason why i ask these questions is because i know that a lot of people frown upon workplace relationships like that like intimate relationships um i don't and the reason why i don't is because um i know quite a few people that met their significant others while at work um you know some of them are happily married some of them you know are together so i don't have an issue with it me myself i've had um, some intimate relationships with people that work that those friendships continue today and even even if it was a fling like I had several flings at, at places I worked at when I was a, a single bachelor and you know they, we was able to keep things you know cool and up and up you know on it sometimes we kept it very discreet so it, it's possible um, as long as both parties are, are mature and there's a lot of consent and there's a lot of discussions on what's going to be done and what's not going to be not to be done anyway I asked if they were in the same department because one thing I will frown upon is if you work with someone like really close, like if you work with them day to day, like consistently, like y'all sit next to each other. I, I kind of like don't think that's a good idea. Not saying that it doesn't work, but it's just not a good idea um, because even if even if y'all end things, you know, on a good note, there still could be, you know, moments of friction and stuff like that. But and also I, I frown upon like fraternization. Like, so, for example, if someone is higher up or below you. Um, Cause you know in relationships there's always power dynamics. Um, when it comes to those kind, there's even more power dynamics, and there's more things to go wrong. And I've seen that happen. So I don't, I don't, I'm not really good on. I'm really against fraternization, so you shouldn't do it. Um, anyway, that being said, they don't work closely together. The, the person said that they see he sees his other person at the. the he works for a big company, and he's and he sees his other person um, only at the cafeteria. Uh, three times about three times a week. So they actually don't work together is work for the same company um, So I, I think it's a good idea to approach that person um, So they don't have that really frequency of contact. They never met before so I figured um, Now the next thing I'm gonna say to, to this person is um, If you're gonna do it do it like face-to-face -face. like if you're gonna approach them do it face-to-face -face. Don't send them an email, you know via company email or call that person's office because that's kind of to me that's creepy. You know, I know rom-coms, they do it all the time. I still think that it's borderline creepy. I think you should approach that person and go from there. Good luck to you. You know who you are. I uh, hope everything works out, you know, whatever your intentions are. So I hope that helps anybody else when it comes to kind of like what you do at the workplace, what you shouldn't do. Um, but just, again, if both of y'all are consenting adults and you're mature about things and you have those discussions, everything should be good, even if it's just a flame. Work. <laughs>
Shout outs, man, for episode 58. First of all, I want to shout out to my barber, Woke D. Shout out to you, brother. Um, been through a lot this week. I'm going to let you know that you are loved. Um, and I appreciate you and the work that you do. And I love the fact that he pretty much cuts the hair of everybody, half the people in my city. And that includes politicians and um, college ball players, you know what I mean? And coaches and assistant coaches. So shout out to you, man, because you always treat me like a celebrity. I um, also want to shout out my people, the ugly people from Virginia, the You Gotta Love Yourself people. They just released the album. You can check it out on iTunes and on SoundCloud. Um, and it's called DMs. Um, you're, gonna, you're not going to regret it. It's short and sweet. It's about seven tracks. Um, I'm going to have to review it because I love y'all. been a fan forever. I'm glad y'all released the album. And shout out to my um, instructor, Roshan uh, Moburn. Um, and he, man, he puts in mad work. He's actually uh, teaches a business plan cl writing class that I'm taking now. So, yep, brother's putting it down on paper. Um, last year, I tried to write one and I just couldn't get through it. And he's helping me push through it, man. Like, really, like, got the creative juices flowing, man. I appreciate you and I love you. Uh, definitely want to shout out um, Mona White, um, who owns... Uh, goddessbathandbody.com I'm going to put her, her website in the show notes uh, sister uh, plus 40 who's man she's gorgeous too check her, check her out on um, on Instagram I'll put her, her IG on there as well but she sells a dope beard cream and beard oil for the brothers and also some, some dope uh, lotions for y'all and a lot of stuff for the sisters man but you know for the brothers out there um, you should definitely check her out I'll put that in there so there you have it for the shout outs peace yeah So there you have another episode, episode number 58, where my killer tape at. Um, definitely, if you want to um, send some questions again that you want me to deal with, um, you can email me at dantrezomi at gmail. So dantrezomi, D-A-N-T-R-E-S-O-M-I at gmail. And make sure in the subject line you put advice. If you want to book me uh, to do inversion workshops for those for you yogis, you b-boys and b-girls and breakers and caporisas, I can do that. Um, and let you know how much that's going to cost. You can just go to, again, email me at Gmail. So it'll be dantrezomi at Gmail. And in the, you know, in the uh, subject line, make sure you put bookings. You can also book me for discussions, too, the same way. If you want to hit me up on the Twitters, um, you can hit me at D-A-N-T-R-E-S-O-M-I, dantrezomi. Or on my more public account, Omi's podcast, O-M-I-S-P-O-D, you know, cast. You know what I mean? So you know where I'm at. Definitely check the show notes for all that information if you lose it here. I love y'all, man. Thank y'all for listening. This is season four, man. We doing our thing, Thizzle, man. Peace and love.